Hello everyone. Thank you very much for being here. We're very excited to have you join us. We, we know that we've got a huge number of registrants today covering many countries from around the world. It's fantastic to be able to share your company so early in 2022. And for those who are experiencing floods and other adverse events, our thoughts are with you. On behalf of all of us at TURN, I acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the lands and waters of Australia, New Zealand, and all nations. And I offer my respect to the elders past, present, and emerging as we work towards a more equitable and reconciled Australia. Um, and one where we recognise and build our shared knowledge and experiences. Today, I'm speaking to you from the Tabukai land, which is rainforest country in far north Queensland, the home of the Bama people. So again, I thank you for joining us today. And for those that haven't met me, my name is Beryl Morris, and I'm the director of TURN, Australia's Ecosystem Observatory. So in this webinar, feel free to ask questions through the webcast using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and we'll answer the questions towards the end. And if you have any technical questions, feel free to comment in the chat function, and we'll try to resolve them as soon as we can. And also, if you can use the chat to contact, you can use the chat to contact other attendees. And we've set up a rating survey that appears in a separate browser as you leave the meeting. And if you could take the time to complete it, that will assist us in turn in planning and reporting. We're recording today's webinar so that we can share it with those who couldn't, couldn't attend today. Um, and in turn, we actually belong to a very large family of uh, organisations. We're federated across Australia. I uh, just thought that you would like to know that. And we face funding from the National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Strategy, INCRIS. It's my great pleasure now to introduce some of our, uh, to introduce our panelists. Oops, sorry. Um, first of all, we're going to hear from distinguished professor Belinda Medlin, who works at the Hawkesbury Institute for the Environment at Western Sydney University. Belinda is Chair of TURN Science Advisory Committee and also sits on our advisory board. Uh, after Belinda, we're going to hear from Professor Glenda Wardle, who is at the University of Sydney and Glenda's a very uh, close associate of TURN, running one of our sites in the Simpson Desert. And she's also our New South Wales Regional Ambassador, making sure we connect TURN with the people of New South Wales. And the last speaker is to be Dr. Alastair Hobday, who is from the, who's a research director at the Centre for Marine Socioecology in CSIRO. And um, Alastair is going to give us uh, a bit of a marine aspect, and he's also uh, helping to put together the Australian uh, Ecological Forecasting Initiative, and he's going to tell you more about that. I now have pleasure in handing over to Belinda to start the, her talk and I shall go off screen. Thank you. Thanks, Beryl. I will just share my screen. <clears throat> um, so I would also like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that I'm on. I'm on Darug land in the Blue Mountains, uh, where it is currently chucking it down. Um, as you can see, that's the, that's the view from my window at the moment. Um, yet again, this is the third time we've had floods uh, in the last two years. Um, it does feel like the last few years have been nonstop one thing after another, from fires to the pandemic to the floods. Um, and if there's one thing that these couple of years have underscored to us, I think, it is the value of forecasting and the value of being able to anticipate what might be coming around the corner so that we can at least start to prepare um, and uh, proactively um, uh, 
address the consequences of what's about to come towards us rather than reacting. Um, so in the fields of weather forecasting and epidemiology, um, that value of forecasting has been underscored many times over. Um, but what about ecosystem forecasting? What about ecological forecasting? Um, so many of you know this is a topic that's very dear to my heart and I can talk for hours about it. But what I want to do today is just really set the scene um, for this webinar um, and, and then uh, hand over to my, my colleagues um, to fill in some of the details. Um, so people often ask, what do we mean by forecasting exactly? And how does that differ by predict from prediction? Um, and so forecasting is really prediction with a time component. So you're trying to predict what is going to happen um, in a time series in the future. Um, if we're talking about ecological forecasting or ecosystem forecasting, um, there was a really nice paper published over 20 years ago now, um, led by Jim Clark, um, which talked about it as uh, an emerging imperative um, and defined it here as the process of predicting into the future, the state of ecosystem services and natural capital. And um, this paper puts some very important additions to that. So it's not just about forecasting the state, it's also about forecasting the uncertainty. So how much do we know about what's likely to happen? And he also, they also make the point about it's being contingent on explicit scenarios um, for climate, land use, population, technologies, etc. cetera. Um, I guess an important point about ecological forecasting and ecosystem forecasting is that um, ecosystems aren't uh, evolving on their own. They aren't changing in time on their own. They're very much subject to external forces. So the climate, um, but also um, the management and the people um, that are living on them and around them and the, the choices that they make. Um, so this paper really set the scene, but nothing really happened um, for the field of forecasting um, in ecolo ecology until um, Jim Clark's PhD student, Mike Dietz, took up the, the gauntlet um, and really formed a community around this idea that we need to start forecasting um, and we need to start forecasting in the short term and we need to do it iteratively. So there's this um, uh, excellent diagram uh, in Mike's paper, which lays out his view um, of ecosystem forecasting. Um, it's a little bit complicated, um, but there's a couple of key points about it. Um, one is about the need for iterative forecasts. Um, so Mike often makes the point that the way that weather forecasts have improved, and they have improved out of sight over the last few decades, and the way that they've done that is simply by iteratively trying, failing, working out what needed to be done to make the forecasts better, and so iteratively improving. Um, and so Mike continually makes the point that we need to do the same thing um, in ecosystem science and ecology, make forecasts, evaluate our forecasts, work out what additional data and what additional science we need to be able to make better forecasts. Um, he also talks a lot about the adaptive management cycle, which fits into this iterative forecast cycle. Um, and this is the cycle where we talk about what options we have um, to modify the outcomes in ecosystems. Um, and that really needs to be part of the ecosystem forecasting process. And um, so this is a really useful um, and uh, valuable detail diagram to get your head around ecosystem forecasting. Um, another way of thinking about um, the different types of problems that we can address um, with ecosystem forecasting is this schema um, that was put together by my great colleague, Ben Smith, who's the research director um, at the Hawkesbury Institute for the Environment. And Ben likes to talk about what, why, and how questions that can be addressed um, with forecasting. Um, and so what questions are questions that talk about what will be the state of some environmental metric 
uh, in the near future. So you're forecasting, you're looking into the future and you're doing it in samples. So you can use the information on how um, that ecological process has evolved uh, in the recent past to help you forecast what's happening into the future. And so uh, some examples for that um, are attempting to forecast pasture biomass, soil moisture, um, CO2 exchange, eddy covariance um, data, for example. Um, the second type of questions are more why questions. So why do we observe the patterns that we do? So sometimes we're trying to forecast things which are out of sample. We're trying to forecast something where we know we can't rely on the recent past because things are changing and we're looking at a non-stationary system. And so what we need to do there is to think about our process knowledge. How do we understand how this system works and we, can we apply that process knowledge to predict out of sample? And so some examples there um, are things like predicting forest dieback. Um, or predicting shifts in vegetation distribution. And then there's a third suite of questions, which are the how questions. And they are really related to that adaptive management cycle. How can we manage or how can we intervene to achieve better outcomes? Um, and so that's where we're looking at decision support and scenario analysis. So to try and understand um, what sorts of levers do we have and how will those levers affect outcomes into the future? Um, and so some examples there um, are things like hazard reduction, um, how do different approaches to hazard reduction affect outcomes in the near term and the longer term, carbon plantings. Um, if we look at uh, afforestation for carbon sequestration, how is that likely to change um, ecosystem outcomes into the future? And um, so I've just got a couple detailed examples <laughs> very briefly um, to illustrate those questions further. So what questions I mentioned pasture biomass is, is um, uh, an example of something that can be forecast based on our current understanding um, and current dynamics into the near term future. Um, and many of you will be familiar with um, the forecasts that are available from Long Paddock, for example, um, where they look at pasture growth um, in the next quarter um, uh, based on the weather, weather forecasts for that quarter um, and using a kind of hybrid process-based empirical model to come up with the pasture growth predictions. Um, so this is a great example of the sorts of forecasts um, that can be made in the near um, term. I guess one place where these forecasts don't fit in with Mike Dietz's scheme is that they're not iterative. So they're not iteratively improved and they're not iteratively getting better, which is the thing that would be great to, to see um, is the fact that these forecasts could actually be getting, be, be being archived, be evaluated and being improved um, as time goes on. Um, the why questions, um, an example from my own group's work, trying to predict forest dieback. Um, so for some time, we've been trying to think about how can we predict where drought related mortality is likely to occur? Um, and we're anticipating that it might happen more often in the future with the climate changing. Um, but there are relatively few examples of where this has happened um, in the past and relatively well document, relatively few well documented examples, um, making it difficult to like fit a um, and machine learning model, for example, to do these predictions. Um, so what we um, have been working on instead is a process-based model, which understands the processes that cause and lead to drought-related mortality, um, like the dieback that you see in the photograph, which occurred in the, in the 2019 drought. Um, and so um, building on an understanding of the um, processes involved um, in causing this kind of dieback has allowed us to come up with um, predictive models um, that attempt to say where we're likely to see dieback. Um, now, where this scheme falls down and doesn't meet Mike Dietz's diagram is that we don't have this working into the future yet. Um, it's very much we can evaluate it 
uh, into the past, um, but we don't have the capacity to say, okay, what's likely to happen over the next few months, for example, um, which is something that I would love to be able to work towards. Um, quick example of the third type of question um, is the how question. Um, and here I didn't have any great examples to hand uh, from Australia. Um, so I've used one from Ben Smith's work in Sweden, uh, where he's applying the LPJ guess dynamic vegetation model. And you can see a scheme um, of what that model uh, involves, what it simulates, um, and an example application to the vegetation of northern Sweden under a future climate scenario. And here what they've done is really to look at management levers and ask those questions about um, what, uh, what options do we have um, to change forest production and damage risk into the future and what are we likely to see um, under different management options. Um, and so here you can see an example of um, how those different management options interact with um, the future production and damage risk. And it's scenarios like this um, that allow this type of modeling to be used to explore um, the impact of different management options. Um, so that's just a, a really brief overview of the types of questions some of the types of questions that can be addressed um, if we are uh, using ecosystem forecasting. Um, now I just want to talk very briefly about some of the challenges that we face. So this is um, really not easy um, to achieve um, Mike Dietz's vision. Um, and there's several, there's scientific challenges and there's technical challenges. And so there's a bunch of them. Um, I'm highlighting two of each here. So one of the scientific challenges is the background variability. So we know in Australia, we have a very variable climate. Um, we are experiencing it at the moment. I'm just showing you here a figure that, um, that Sammy Riffi put together for Jason Beringer's um, paper, which is in press coming out soon, I believe. Um, which is the Ausflux 20-year uh, celebration paper, um, which just shows you where the Ausflux sites sit in terms of precipitation variability. And what you can see here is that the, the variability in precipitation experienced by most of the Ausflux sites is much larger than that seen in many of the Fluxnet sites. And with that, the thing is with that background of variability, it makes it so much harder to detect change which again makes it harder to forecast because we don't know if we are seeing natural variability or when we're starting to see change. So that's one uh, scientific challenge. Another scientific challenge to highlight is the limits to predictability. So um, it's still a question, how many things are actually predictable? Um, in ecology and ecosystem science. And here I'm harking back to an old paper from um, Lord May uh, from back in the days when he was working in Sydney University. Um, he actually is one of the people that kickstarted chaos theory by looking at biological populations. Um, and so there is, you know, a, a well established body of theory that talks about. Um, the inability to predict fluctuations in biological populations because they can be chaotic. So this is an example of something that is, is fundamentally not really predictable. Um, and so we have a question to address about what can we predict and what can we not hope to predict? And that's actually a really important question to address because whenever we make a prediction, we want to have some kind of certainty around it. Um, and we need to communicate that certainty um, because if decisions are going to be made on our predictions, um, then the uncertainty really needs to be understood. So quantifying uncertainties um, is another huge um, scientific challenge. Technical challenges, I'd highlight two of them here, and one of them is getting access to the data that you need to support forecasting. So forecasting fundamentally needs to be data-driven. It needs to use... Um, the current state of ecosystems to be able to make forecasts. And then we need to be able to evaluate 
um, those forecasts against data. So we need access to data and we need access to data in a very timely fashion. And TURN obviously has made huge strides in making that possible in our community, but there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, and then the other um, challenge that I would really highlight is the need to have people uh, who are trained to do forecasting. Um, and that's my opportunity to fly the flag a moment and say that I do have some PhD scholarships available coming up. Um, if people are interested in looking at vegetation dynamic forecasting, please just drop me a line. Um, but PhD scholarships aren't enough by any means. Um, what we really need is a community of people who are trained in forecasting techniques. Um, and so we need not just um, a handful of PhD students, what we really need to be thinking about is how do we make sure that our undergraduate and masters and PhD programs train people in the techniques that they're likely to need to be able to do the forecasts that we'd like to be able to achieve. Um, and there's a number of um, uh, opportunities that have become available through the ecological forecasting initiative in the US that we'd really like to kickstart here as well. And I guess Alistair will talk about that when, um, when it's his turn to speak. Um, but for now, I'll stop talking and I'll just hand over to Glenda. Thank you very much, Belinda. And um, you've nicely picked up on uh, some of the points that I would also be uh, making some points about. Just checking that you can see my screen. So forecasting ecosystem changes um, is something that needs to be um, done by a large community of people. And you can see by the logos and some of these are overlapping with some of the entities that um, Belinda has shared. So we'll launch into uh, what I can share with you. Firstly, um, I would like to also acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands that I'm on and where I work and also for you. It's very important that we understand that this country was never ceded. Conversation starters here. Um, I put these up to give you something to ponder about is the uh, myself and the and Alistair that follows have our uh, presentations. Firstly, do you agree that nature is predictable? We're just absolutely distracted by the rain at the moment. So I've got a little shot there of rain parrot on my phone and it's you know mentioning that light rain in 46 minutes, that was yesterday and so on. So we're used to having that kind of information about some of the physical properties of our world. What's important to you about ecological forecasts? How, how accurate do they have to be? How much do you uh, use them? Are they just uh, something that you think others will be doing or is it something that you're going to be involved in? A really big thing, and it did come up in Belinda's talk, is how comfortable are you with uncertainty or probabilistic forecasts? We'd love everything to be certain, but that's not how it is. And I think in... Um, gathering our own understanding and also communicating that to end users, we need to embrace that uncertainty. And particularly as um, this endeavor, and it's growing from the efforts um, that Belinda has talked about for um, the international work, but hopefully growing for Australia, I want you to consider what you can bring to the ecosystem uh, forecasting community. Just briefly then, what is a forecast? Well, it's about modeling time series data to anticipate the future. So it's out of sample forecasting and it's a subset of prediction. So how do people generally understand forecasts? Well, some of us come from the technical side first and we want to write um, mathematical equations. Sorry, I'm just... Thank you. 
just getting a note that the um, PowerPoint wasn't on full screen. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, so some of us come from the technical or mathematical side of things, and others come from the wanting to be using the forecast and therefore needing the storytelling to be front of the um, communication. So on the left here is an example of a population model, a demographic model of the greater snow goose. And so there's observed data with a model built around it. And then the colorful areas are predictions forward um, under different uh, representative concentration pathways. So it's a, a fairly long uh, decadal type of forecast situation. And on the right is a forecast of good pasture growth um, for uh, area of Australia that we work in. And this is the same long paddock um, Aussie grass model that Belinda also gave some examples of. So from the mathematical to the visualization, somewhere in there that mix are these scenarios or outlooks. And in fact, we're getting more uh, familiar with those for production systems in terms of uh, the Australian government ABARES outlook, which there's been a conference on this week. So what makes a forecast good? For some of us, it's about the consistency. Um, does the forecast correspond to the knowledge that we have of the system and what we expect it to do? The quality, does the forecast correspond to what happened next? So do we check the forecast prediction against the next observation, so the T plus one? And also another dimension of what makes a forecast good is its value. And that's its value in decision-making or some other benefit that's realized. So we're familiar with weather forecasts. So it's a good example of talking about improvement in skill and picking up on a point that Belinda raised as well. Many of you may have seen this diagram, but recently I've realized that when we look at it quickly, it doesn't quite present what we may be thinking. So I thought I'd just highlight here that what we're seeing is a forecast skill as a percentage from the 80s till about 2013. And I've highlighted here a line that shows the improvement in skill of about 12% for the Northern Hemisphere. There's also a difference that the Southern Hemisphere improvement in skill was actually more because it cut, started from a lower point. The Southern, southern Hemisphere forecasts um, lagged behind until about this point in the 2000s, and now they pretty much overlap. The next thing to notice, of course, is this, that the skill um, decreases as you go three days out to 10 days out, the forecast horizon. So the, the further into the future you go, the more uncertain things become, and we sort of expect that. But another observation we can take from this is in the last decade, these uh, differences in the forecast skill really haven't changed that much. So um, how well we're doing at those differences. So taking this another way then, we can look at the forecast skill against daily, weekly or monthly to seasonal averages. And these sub-seasonal to seasonal are really important for decision-making in terms of land users, land managers. And so that's a really important place for us to focus on for advances. So taking into account the user needs right at the beginning and making reliable and actionable information, I think should drive how we build the infrastructure and the community around ecological and ecosystem forecasting. However, there are obstacles to prediction in ecosystems and Belinda's nicely raised some of these and I'm sure Alistair will revisit them as well. Firstly, for their historical entities. So there's prior effects that keep on having an influence into the future. We want to model some of those, but we don't always have the initial conditions well nailed down. They're also complex systems, and that's both a treasure and a bit of a barrier sometimes. The dynamics are stochastic, and as Belinda pointed out, of course, sometimes those dynamics are chaotic and therefore not so predictable. Importantly, they're also influenced by social and economic and other kinds of uh, drivers outside of the pure biological or physical systems. So this is a wonderful diagram from some colleagues in the Netherlands that 
invited to me yesterday by Beryl, actually. And I just thought it was a nice idea to go, this is what a lot of people think when they think about modeling. And they think, well, I'm interested in this terrestrial biodiversity. What do I need to understand in order to predict that? What is essential to the modeling? So it's very important to be purposeful about where to begin. So on a matrix of how much effort do I have to put in for how much impact will it have? You're going for high impact and low effort. There are some things that could take a lot of work and a lot of time, but you're not going to get any um, real realization in any reasonable time. So be purposeful. Here's just an example of what I mean by this. So we see here is a, a news item from last year. Um, Australia has a plague of uh, grasshoppers that eat the crops and they need to pay money to get that to stop. So it's calling for a forecast tool that would determine the triggers for the grasshopper population booms so that management could intervene in, the, um, in a very timely fashion. So it's a very focused kind of um, requirement. In our own work, we've been um, building towards forecasting for some time. So predicting mechanisms, and mechanisms of change from rain through to resource increases and up to changes at the ecosystem level. And we've done this over many types of things with fire return intervals, greenness and cover of vegetation, boom and bust of rodents, all the way down to even decoupling of assemblages. So these are not yet into the proper forecasting in the near term iterative that we want. That's where we're working now, but that's where we've come from. Another a dimension to our work is to move to productive systems where we understand the end user requirements and the management. So working on agricultural lands, we can team up with these biodiversity ecosystem type of requirements with all the production infrastructure because they have a great deal of um, sensor technology as well. So on this University of Sydney farm, we've put in an array of 20 sensor locations where we have cameras, eco-acoustic eco sensors, anabats for bats, and um, the data are coming in almost in near time. So here's an example of comparing in the farm area, cropping, forest, and pasture, the uh, bioacoustic indices, which are compiled off the acoustic records to look at things like um, the biodiversity index tells you about the proportion or abundance of calls that might be from birds in there. And clearly that changes from um, season to month in terms of what you're hearing and whether it's more in crops or more in other areas. So this is an opportunity to link the biodiversity on the farm to the other requirements there and particularly to build these partnerships. And there'd be many other of these activities in other universities agricultural stations and to scale that up to be ready for national forecasting. Um, that would be really wonderful. So the key elements required to enable forecasting is to understand how the system works, to have rigorous monitoring, to have good data management and reporting, and in parallel with that, to put the socioeconomic framework around it. So there are social challenges. We have to uh, work in areas that we may be uncomfortable, so come out of our silo. We have to work towards common goals, build inclusive culture and diversity in those teams. We have to exchange and share the concepts and language, and that takes time. And of course, this should be resourced, and as Belinda said, the training and skills are very important. So this work has begun with the EFI initiative, the Ecosystem Forecasting Initiative that Mike and others are leading, and actually helping out as well there. And this piece of work was put together from uh, thinking about all of the different advances that have been happening. And what I was suggesting here is that it's really timely that we think about translating that wisdom and those efforts into the types of forecasts that we might want here in Australia. And these are very broad. We are waiting to hear what the outcome will be for the National Research Infrastructure but there's been a wonderful scoping study done on the National Environment Prediction System, taking into account a social architecture that would be needed, which, which organizations and institutions, the um, information, the data streams and standards for those, and many of us are working towards those 
as well as the cyber and technical infrastructure behind that. So Australia fortunately has a range of wonderful national facilities, including TURN, IMOS, ALA, Bureau of Meteorology, et cetera. And there's been a great deal of thought into the types of things that they can contribute in terms of the data, the infrastructure, the modeling capability, um, and also putting things together as higher level indicators. It's a great piece of work. We also have these little dilemmas, which is sometimes by putting the humans within the system, which is what is now much more understood is that the human component is within the ecosystem and not outside of it. This can actually affect the accuracy of the forecast because if we know what's going to happen, we can actually start to do things differently and influence the actual outcome and that can decrease the accuracy of the forecast. Another thing we need to be open to is the modeling styles. So that big diagram I put of all of the uh, connections would be a full mechanistic process-based model. There's also been a great deal of work in the statistical or machine learning AI type approaches and colleagues at the um, Data Analytics for Environment and Resources, Resources and Environment rather, are looking at these hybrid models that use the power of both kinds of things in good combinations. And I think that would, that would be very productive going forward. Uh, another way we can make progress very quickly is to take up the type of challenges that have been run by EFI in combination with their observatory, NEON. And that has led to many um, developments in terms of the workflows, the standards and maintaining um, and archiving resources for these teams that put together forecasts that then can be seen collectively as ensembles to see where we can get that iterative improvement. So recapping then, forecasting ecological change has a lot of challenges. The opportunities are in a national environmental prediction system, drawing off longer term studies, drawing from these major resources and capabilities in our observatories. And the next steps would be an Australian chapter of FE leading an observatory based forecast challenge. So thank you. And uh, next up, we have Alistair Hobday. Thank you. Oh, hello everyone. I'm coming from Muanina country in Tasmania. My background is a biological oceanographer and in that kind of field you're trying to understand the influence of the environment on say the distribution and an abundance of marine species and biological oceanographers typically try to do that historically by understanding past pattern and my journey has been through from historical pattern through to the future and I'll talk you through some of that now. In particular I'll acknowledge uh, Jason, Claire, Paige, Curtis, Steph and Kylie, some of my main collaborators on the forecasting applications that I'll talk to you about today. In the ocean, the definition of an ecological forecast is exactly the same as, as Belinda and Glenda have shared with you. We're looking to predict changes in the ecosystem components in response to environmental drivers. A number of areas that I wish we could talk more about today are uh, the ecological forecasting methods. What's under the hood? You know, forecasting can be based on your experience. This year, it's a La Nina, we expect to see some event X. It can be with statistical models that you condition with historical data in order to make some prediction about the future. Or it can be a dynamical model that has the future embedded in it, in, the term, in model projections. Coupled models and ecosystem models are examples there. Also, we won't have time to talk about how you do skill assessment of forecasts. Just, I think I'd make the point that we're doing it and you can do, an, do a skill assessment of your forecast. And uncertainty has been mentioned both by Belinda and Glenda there previously. So as a biological oceanographer, I got pretty excited when climate modelers started making physical projections to the year 2100. And I thought we could just do that for fisheries and it would be fantastic. So some of the early work was taking IPCC class physical model output, running it through a biological statistical model and showing that fish species would live somewhere else by the year 2100. And I thought that was great. I liked it so much that with colleagues, we thought, what about other time periods and other fishes? What about 2060? 
And in this case here, this just compares in the top row distribution of two species of fish, a bluefin tuna and a yellowfin tuna in the present and in the future. And in the middle column, the red shows a decline in the area where the bluefin species will be found. And in the right hand column, an increase in the red area shows more of the yellowfin tuna. And gee, that was good doing that kind of work. We were making predictions about 2100, 2060s and so on. But when I talked to people, particularly fishermen, it wasn't very useful. And the lesson for me and our colleagues in that period, that the time scale at which we were doing these ecological forecasts was just too long. And they might have been useful to policymakers designing um, future mitigation attempts. Other scientists sure used them in IPCC type of assessments or in experiments. But for marine resource users, an end of century prediction is not really very much use. And the reason is that we, we think is that the number of decisions that you make about your life or your way or your experience in the environment decreases into the future. And so by the year 2100, you know, the audience here is probably making very few decisions about the future. And so with the research group, we decided to focus on shorter time scales in our forecasting. Our first example that we were working on was Southern Bluefin Tuna, and we started this forecasting in 2003. And so it was Australia's first, and I put marine there, not knowing the terrestrial as well, but it was the first real-time spatial management based on an ecological forecast. We put electronic tags on tuna. They would swim around, gather information about the environment, where they like to live. That information would come back via satellite. We would construct habitat preferences, add those to an ocean model, and produce a map of where we expected those fish to be living. We would then pass that to a management agency who would then make management maps about where fishermen would be allowed to go in the ocean in order to catch fish. This wasn't a fish finding tool because the fishery had quota management. And so it didn't help you catch more fish. It just changed where you were allowed to catch them. And when we gave our habitat models to the management agency, they would then turn it into a set of rules to be put out on the water. And over time, they became more and more complex. On the left-hand example is three zones, high tuna abundance, medium tuna abundance, and low tuna abundance. And that can be described by four coordinates, just the endpoints of those blue and green lines. In the middle, it's the lines are a little bit more complex separating those spaces. And on the right-hand side, it's quite a complex zoning pattern that more truly reflects what the ecological forecast was showing. And every two weeks, we were delivering these forecasts, the management was putting them in place, and we had that iteration and learning process. And over time, management came more and more comfortable with putting in complex zoning. On this graph here on the y-axis, it goes from not very complex on the lower left to the top of the y-axis is quite complex management arrangements. And then over the years that we were supplying these forecasts, the management agency started to apply more and more complex spatial management that really truly reflected where the fish were living. And things were going along very nicely until 2008. And then we noticed there was a real drop off in terms of how complex the management arrangement was. And it became apparent there'd been a change in the management team and we hadn't really bothered to keep in touch with how the forecasts were being used. We then put a big effort in and you can see a, a jump there with an arrow at around 2011 to 2012. And we talked with the management agency again about how to use an ecological forecast. Things went fine. Then the management um, workers changed again and we dropped back down to a not very useful use of the forecast. Again, a heavy engagement and bang, they were back up the next year in, in using them more accurately. So a lesson for us in that was even when you're providing short-term iterative forecasts, it's really important to have very frequent engagement with the end users. And that engagement started to explain to us why the number of decisions vary depending on the time scale. If you're supplying an ecological forecast on the scale of days, then the types of decisions that get made are around zoning, extreme weather plans, where fishermen are go fishing, whether they'll do maintenance on their boat or go to sea. With seasonal forecasting, weeks to month, there are fewer decisions because they're happening slightly further in the future. You might plan for your upcoming season, coordinate your activities, order feeds, purchase quota, and so on. And by the time you're out at the decades to centuries, the 2100 forecast, there are very few tactical decisions that are being made. 
So our focus was then, let's go into the period of time that's most useful for proactive marine management. And so we've focused a lot now on seasonal forecasting because it is giving the um, iterative aspects. You can learn from your forecast. It's a nice number of decisions that are being made and we can see real responses to the forecast that we're delivering. And it's also the belief of our research group that if you have well-managed marine resources, then they should do better under climate change, a message I'll return to shortly. In order to do these seasonal forecast models, we needed to have a model that would tell us about the future environment. And with Claire Spillman from the Bureau of, Bureau of Meteorology, we've used several iterations of a dynamical global coupled ocean atmosphere forecast system. And that gives us information about the upcoming six to nine months. And we're able to use that as our data layers in order to add the biology and see where animals will be found in the future. Now that we've started doing that seasonal work, we've got close to a dozen applications that we've used around Australia. Not all of these are operational, in part because the management application may not always exist. And so some of them have been demonstrations and some of them are ongoing management applications now. They have, um, in each of those cases, strong industry engagement has really been essential. And that's because we then understand the decision context and we design the forecast products so that they're really useful and deliver those in a range of ways, web pages, briefings, reports, webs, uh, email, and so on. The first example then is when we took our bluefin tuna work on the east coast of Australia and started to predict into the future where fish would be found. And we were able to produce products like on the lower left-hand side, which shows how far north or south you are along the Australian coastline on the y-axis, and then month of the year on the x-axis. The yellow band shows the typical pattern that we expect to see from year to year. The blue lines above and below the yellow show the most extreme years that we've seen in terms of hot and cold years, for example. And then the red band was where we were traveling in this particular year, progress to date. And then a series of red stars show where our forecast suggested that the tuna habitat would be found in the future. So you were able to provide a context for what the environment was going to offer in the coming months. And that allowed upcoming, that in, allowed future planning around where zones would go in the water, what ports fishermen would use, and they would modify their fishing activities in response. The series of six plots on the right-hand side just shows the spatial resolution of these forecasts that that model um, capacity allowed us to do. The second example is for, again, a species of tuna in Southern Australia. In Southern Australia, these fish um, migrate down from Indonesia. They live in these waters during the summer months and migrate out to the Indian Ocean and the uh, Tasman Sea in the winter. And in this area of Australia, we have a fishery that exploits these very large schools of fish. They're captured in purse seine nets, transferred into tow cages, and then transported some 500 kilometres back to fattening cages where they're kept for about six months before they're harvested. And under climate change, the location of where these vessels could catch fish was changing. And so they would put this very slow infrastructure in place and then the fish would not arrive. And so we developed a forecast system that would show you where these fish were likely to be in future. In this case, it ran out several months ahead of time, which was about the level of skill that we had with this approach. And on the left-hand panel just shows sea surface temperature, in this case from February, March, March and April. And again, you can see the size of the grid cells on that show you the resolution of the forecast. And in the right-hand side, that has been converted into a prediction of where the fish will be expected to be. And how much they like it is indicated by the color bar. And the bone color indicates areas of high desirability and the blue is areas of low desirability. And that's delivered um, every couple of weeks via a website in order to allow the operators to plan their fishing operations. Again, it doesn't help you catch more fish because it has quota management. It just helps improve economic efficiency. And the economic efficiency is a real advantage of forecasting. If you have a forecast and you use it well, in a good year, you should do even better than if you had no forecast. Um, you would still do better than average in a good year, but the forecast lets you beat, beat the average by a long way. And if you have forecast information in a bad year, you should lose less than if you had no forecast at all. 
And again, if you're supplying forecasts that help businesses to be profitable, we hope that they're adapting well to climate change. And adapting to climate change is particularly important because the, in the ocean, things are changing very, very quickly. And this schematic shows for the decade 2020 to 2029, how many of the years in that decade will fall, out, are re, fall outside our experience in recent years. And everywhere it's red, that's basically 10 of the next 10 years are gonna be outside our historical experience. And that means that a forecast is extremely useful because you're encountering conditions that you've never seen before. And so in a changing world, a forecast can actually increase your coping range. In this example here, the y-axis shows dollars and the x-axis goes from good environmental quality on the left to bad environmental quality on the right. And when your profit and loss curves cross over, you can no longer continue to do what you do in that environment, whether it's fishing or farming or, or aquaculture. If you have a forecast though, your costs should go down for any type of environmental condition and your profits should increase for any type of environmental condition. And so that changes the crossover point between profit and loss, and it should increase your ability to cope in a changing environment. You increase your, your environmental suitability by some number of years, which can allow other actions to take place. I just finished by saying that in all of these forecasting applications, as I did with the year 2100, Sometimes we forecast because we can. Um, I think it's really important as you work with stakeholders whose lives are impacted by your forecast, why do you forecast and what are some of the things that you should be wary about? So with some other colleagues, we've written a little bit about the ethical considerations of forecasting. And in the stages of forecast development, scoping, development, delivery and evaluation, there are different kinds of ethical or unanticipated consequences that you encounter. And I'd encourage any forecast developer to think about what happens when they make a statement about the future. What might be the unanticipated consequences there? The lessons from the projects that I've been involved with, essentials, you need a model with youthful skill in the region of interest. If you don't have some model that is skillful, um, you've got no forecasting to, fall, to, um, to offer. Strong industry engagement and partnership. Whoever the user of that forecast is, it's really important that they're engaged early. And that will give you a very clear understanding of the end user skills and therefore what kind of products are best suited for them. Um, if you've got that industry feedback, it speeds up that iterative process of refinement that we've been emphasizing today. Um, some things that are very useful, if you can use the end users data in your models, that's really a powerful thing because all of a sudden you're using information that they've collected and they trust. Because projects often finish when the money runs out, having an industry advocate or liaison officer who can take over your forecast interpretation once your project is finished is really valuable. Um, and I can't emphasize enough how much it makes a difference getting out in the field and actually meeting the people who are gonna use your forecasts. And as scientists, we're sometimes cautious about how good our forecasts have to be before we use them. If you understand the decision context, then I think you can start to deliver forecasts that aren't perfect because you can iterate and learn as you go. And so in the, the thinking about forecasts, I think perfect can be the enemy of the good. We've exposed you a little bit today in the idea that there'll be an ecological forecasting initiative, Oceana or Australia chapter getting going. Um, through this membership, oh, sorry, through attendance of this seminar and other lists that we have, We'll shortly be reaching out to you to establish an Australian package of activities for the coming year. And I hope that the ecological forecasting community will really um, grow and learn a lot together by working um, on forecasting problems such as we've talked about today. Thank you very much. And I'll stop my share. That's just brilliant. Thank you very much, um, Alastair, Glenda and Belinda. Um, we have time for a few questions, and I noticed that there's been some dialogue going on in the chat section. No, no questions open in the Q&A. Um, actually, Belinda, the, the question that both Mark Westby and Jamie cleverly have tackled on behalf of Carol McCartney about given that ecological aspects are most strongly do, uh, driven by major events such as drought, flood, fire, will we be able to make reliable ecological forecasts over years until those key drivers are 
a forecast. And in your talk, you made an emphasis on it's really important to do ecological forecasting, but we do have challenges scientifically and technically. Is this what you were thinking of when? Yeah, that's a, that's that's another one um, <laughs> that exactly what Carell said there that it, we are dependent to some degree on our capacity to forecast weather conditions. Um, and there's been some very good answers in the chat there as well, which are, are similar to the sorts of things that I would have said. Um, uh, so Mark is talking about conditional forecasts. So you can start talking about probabilities um, and likelihoods. Um, and, and I think it's worth thinking too about um, the difference between weather prediction and climate prediction, which you know, suggests that there could also be a couple of different scales um, for ecological forecasting. So the weather prediction, you know, we, we, um, there's seasonal forecasts which have some skill um, which could be drawn upon to drive ecological forecasts, but then there's also climate predictions which have considerable skill um, which can be used to make projections at longer timescales, um, which are valuable in the ecological context it, particularly terrestrial ecosystems. I mean, I've been sitting here reflecting on Alistair's talk um, and the, you know, the similarities and the differences between what we're trying to predict with vegetation um, and what you're trying to predict with fisheries. And some of the timescale issues are a little bit different. Um, and so that's, that's kind of interesting to think about um, because some of our decisions that we are making do have long-term consequences. Um, and so we do need to make decisions that are um, at longer time scales. Um, so, you know, if you plant a forest now, it's going to be 20 years before it becomes a fire risk. Um, but you want to know what you're in for um, on that time frame, for example. Ah, Alistair's put his bit in as well. I, Alistair and Glenda, I was really fascinated because Glenda, you you were emphasizing that social context is as important as the technological methods. And Alistair, you were indicating that the decision context is important to understand. Are they one and the same? Is that yeah, I'll go first maybe and say I think they are and they're different dimensions of what you, you need to consider at the start. So we're getting used to this idea that you don't build it and see if they come. You actually find out what is the requirement and also with a changing baseline. Um, what was useful in the past may not be useful into the future. And to stay connected with how people are going to use the information is vitally important. And sometimes we've come as a little bit of an advantage if you're both the data collector and the modeler, which we're in our science area, you do get a slight uh, lead on that. So to answer the question Belinda answered, for the unpredictable arid areas of Australia, because the events are big, because it's flooding rains and big fires, we can do a conditional forecast as in if it's over 300 mils, the grass will grow, it will then have a fire a year later. So um, I think the social context is definitely for the decision making, but it's also about the who's doing it. And I think bringing more types of views in is really important, not science only. Uh, traditional owner viewpoints is extremely important for Australia and training um, the young folk coming behind us to want to be part of this community, not leaving them behind. And Alistair, any comments? Well done, Glenda. <laughs> oh dear. Well, we are getting very near to the close of our wonderful webinar. And I think uh, all of those hundreds of uh, registrants will join me in thanking a splendid set of talks by Belinda Medlin, Glenda Wardle, and Alastair Hobday. And I hope that. Uh, Sorry, I have um, just lost my screen, but I hope that I hope I'm sharing the right screen. Am I sharing the right screen with everyone? No, I'm not sharing the right screen. Something's gone gone wrong there. I shall just see whether I can do that again. I'll share. Ah, there we go. 
And having had such a wonderful start to our 2022 webinar series, I'm really hopeful that we'll have everyone attending again on the 4th of May when we have our next webinar on the impacts on, of agricultural ecosystems. And that's deliberately vague and you'll have to join us in order to find out what we mean by that. Until then, um, I'm hoping that, oops, okay, stop sharing that one. Sorry, having troubles with technology, thunderstorm overhead. But we thank you all and we look forward to seeing everyone again.